Hello, my excellent biologists. Today we're going to talk about cell structures and their functions. And hopefully you picked up the group shared notes. They're located down in the description of the video. Remember, there are two columns. Column one is for you to fill out. Wherever there's a yellow highlighted part, that means there's some notes you need to take right there. And column two is for you to add in additional pictures and things that help. All right. So let's get started. I'm going to make myself a little bit smaller over here and get in presentation mode. All right, so cell structures and functions, and I need a pointer. Okay, and here we go. All right, so the first thing that we need to talk about is the cell theory. So the cell theory, and there are different parts to it, so let me just go through it each part, okay? So the first part is that all living things are composed of cells. Look, I'm a little cell down here. All living things are composed of cells. The second part of the cell theory says that cells are the structural and functional unit of organisms. It's what they are built out of. If you remember our discussion about the four important organic molecules and we talked about the bricks that make them up, right? Amino acids build proteins, well cells build living organisms. And the third part to that is that cells only come from pre-existing cells. That's the only way you can get them. So that cell has to replicate itself in some way. And we're gonna talk about things like binary fission and mitosis and meiosis. So on your notes where it says the cell theory, you wanna just fill that part in, okay? Sorry, hairs in my face. Okay, all living things are composed of cells and you already have number two and number three cells come from pre-existing cells. All right, so our next part is we want to talk about the size of cells. So cells are very, very small. And when we talk about measurements of it, um, you want to look at this diagram here across the top about what we can see with our own eyes. So if you look right here, the human eye, obviously these are not drawn to scale, otherwise mice would be terrifying, ants too. But if you look what the eye can see, we can go down to about as small as one a human egg, right? And then we're gonna start to need a light microscope in order to see those things, and then an electron microscope to see the smaller things. Some things we can't see, right? We don't have the equipment in order to see those. So when you look at the scale, prokaryotic cells, those are smaller. They are basically one to 10 micrometers. Whereas eukaryotic cells are 10 to 100 micrometers. Now, what does that mean? That means the components of a eukaryotic cell and you are built out of eukaryotic cells. The little organelles inside of those eukaryotic cells, they are about the size of a prokaryotic cell. All right, and we'll look to see why do we think that is. I've given you some measurements off here to the side if that would help you. So if you look at one meter equals a thousand millimeters and in your eyes, think of like in, when you were in a classroom or maybe at your house, you have a meter stick, right? So there's a thousand millimeters in that and then one millimeter has a thousand micrometers and then one micrometer has a thousand nanometers just for scale. So um, cells need to be small in order for them to function and we'll talk about why that is. It has to do with surface area to volume. Now, let me walk you through this, okay? Let's look at this cube. And if you look at the cube on this first cube right here, if you calculated the surface area, all of its edges per its volume in inside, and here's the math to do that. If you wanna calculate surface area, it's height, right? And it's a four centimeter cube, so its height would be four, times its width, still four, the number of sides, right? So you have a six-sided cube times the number of cubes you have. You just have one cube. So if you calculate that out and then you calculate the volume, height, width, length, and number of cubes, you will find that the ratio of surface area to volume, the surface area is 1.5, so one and a half times that of the volume, which is one. But if you can take that same cube and instead take the same amount of volume, but break it into eight cubes instead. So now you've created more edges, right? Look at all the edges we've created inside here. We have created more edges. 
So when you do the math now, right, because the number of cubes has changed as well, then it's three to one. So the surface area is three times that of the volume. And then let's break it down even smaller into 64 cubes. Now your surface area is six to one. Now, why that is why cells are so small, these components that build you, is because you need a large surface area to volume to make them function. Okay, because let me make myself bigger and talk to you for a second, okay? Because it's across those cell membranes where everything gets exchanged, going in and out of those cells. So I want you to think about um, three places, okay? I want you to think about the gym at school, think about your classroom, and then think about like a closet or an elevator, right? If you had somebody who walked into any one of those places and they sprayed a bunch of cologne on where you're like, ah, it's too much, right? If you think about the gym, if they walk in through the gym door and all the people that are in that gym, it's not gonna be a lot of people that are impacted by that ax, right? Because it's so big. Ax would be that cologne that's sprayed icky. Okay, so anyway, unless you love it, and I'm sorry. Okay, but you wouldn't be impact impacted so much by that person with that heavy cologne on walking into a gym because the gym is huge. Okay, now let's make that a little bit smaller. Let's increase the surface area to volume, right? If somebody comes into your classroom with acts, they're gonna be several people with it oversprayed. They're gonna be several people that are impacted right when they walk in the door. Now, if you walk into an elevator with somebody who's got too much cologne on, okay, everybody knows this is it. And I want you to think about it like if there are nutrients or waste that are moving around in the cell, if there's reactions that are occurring, if you have that smaller cell, if you have that smaller compartmentalization, okay, then whatever's going on in there, the reactions that need to be, take place are more effective, right, because they impact that whole cell. And that exchange for things going in and out has a greater impact as well. All right, so cells need to be small so they have that large surface area per volume. Think elevator, right, as opposed to a gym. Now, eukaryotic cells, which are larger, okay, they solve this problem by making small compartmentalizations. It's like putting a bunch of elevators in the gym or a bunch of classrooms in the gym, and they compartmentalize that way, and that's why they have those membrane-enclosed organelles. So there's different ways to solve that same problem. So on your notes for cell size, the requirements. Cells need a large surface area, okay, plasma membrane to adequately exchange materials, to eliminate waste products, to acquire or dissipate thermal energy. So um, cells need a large surface area, plasma membrane to adequately exchange materials, eliminate waste products, acquire or dissipate thermal energy. What's thermal energy? Heat. Okay, so smaller cells have a larger surface area to volume ratio. And in your notes, I embedded from um, the college board and from the formulas and equations you need to know, I actually inserted them in there so you can practice that. So there is that equation sheet and there is a link to that. Right, so increasing surface area, then you're gonna increase the diffusion and exchange rate that you have. And then the opposite of that, if you decrease the surface area, you're gonna decrease your um, surface area, decreasing your exchange rate. All right, and I gave you prokaryotic versus eukaryotic. And then on number three, surface area to volume requires that cells are small. And then there can be modifications to increase surface area like folds. We're gonna learn about microvilli. And so folds can help increase the overall surface area or mesosomes, which are in folds. That's when it folds inside. All right, and then I wanna give you an example. Maybe, maybe, okay, elephant versus a whale. So where an elephant lives, it could be very, very hot. And so what they're gonna wanna do is get rid of that heat energy and they're such a large organism. So the benefit of those thin, broad ears is that increases the surface area per volume and allows them to dissipate heat through their ears, as opposed to a whale who is a mammal and in the ocean, they're not worried about being too hot, they're worried about being too 
cold, right? So they want to decrease those types of places on their body. You don't see big flappy things. You see their fins, obviously, but they're trying to maintain their temperature. And then think about what you do, right? When you're hot and you're outside, you're like, ah, I'm hot. You spread out. You try to increase all the surfaces that um, could be, help you to cool yourself. But when you're cold, what do we do? When we're cold and we're standing outside and we're shivering, we bring our arms, legs in, and we try to decrease those surface areas. So hopefully that will help you remember that. All right. So let's move on now and apply this and let's look at prokaryotic cells. Now, prokaryotic cells are again, smaller than eukaryotic cells and they are about the size of an organelle in a eukaryotic cell. And we wanna go over, they have different shapes. You can see them all up here, okay? Different shapes and we need to look inside um, the cell itself. You're not going to see things like a mighty mitochondria. You're not going to see a nucleus because they don't have any of those things. Now they do have DNA, right? Cause that's the code book for life, but it's not enclosed within a membrane. It is just a region called a nucleoid region where that DNA hangs out. They have things like ribosomes on there. And what we're going to learn about is ribosomes are the workbench to synthesize proteins. What are proteins made out of? Amino acids, right? So you need to hook amino acids together to build proteins. That's going to occur on the workbench of ribosomes. And we will learn how that process takes place. That's called translation. All right. Um, let's look at the layers that you can see here on the outside. So the innermost layer of every cell, the very first thing, all cells, all cells is going to be your cell membrane. Your cell membrane is your doorman. It decides what goes in, what goes out. And we're going to, next chapter, we're going to talk all about cell membranes. Then you can see the next layer out for um, prokaryotes is a cell wall. And we'll talk about the structures of those cell walls. They, they help give it its shape but it's also protective because if too much water came in a cell, right, it would blow it up like a balloon. If you had a water balloon, you kept putting water in, kept putting water in, eventually what's it gonna do? It's gonna burst, right? So cell walls can help do that. They can also protect it from, from things that maybe want to come in, right? It can be some sort of lattice or barrier, and we'll talk about that. And then the outside is a capsule. The capsule, it could be slimy, it could be more so solid, and so there's variations on that. Um, these things also that you see look, that kind of look like hairs on the outside, these can help it grip um, onto a surface. And some of them, like you see this one where it says pili down here, is like a sex pillus. Um, and this is how two bacteria can have sex, is they grow the sex pillus out and extend it over to another um, bacteria, and then they will exchange DNA across that sex pillus. So I'm gonna show you another picture, okay? Oh, before I do, let's go to your notes where it says 4.2 prokaryotic cells. So they lack a nucleus. They're smaller and simpler than eukaryotic cells. Okay, and there are two domains. Now, this is gonna be new to you, okay? But when we look at the, the um, classification of life, you can take all of life, all of life, and sort it into three baskets, okay? Those three baskets, okay, are eukarya, and eukaryotic cells all belong in that one basket. So those are cells that contain membrane enclosed organelles. The next two, Okay, the next two are bacteria and archaea. Now what both of those have in common is they're made out of prokaryotic cells, like what you're seeing right here on this slide. But there are differences between these prokaryotic cells. Some prokaryotic cells are what's called, they're extremophiles, they can live where it's very, very hot or very low pH or um, where it's very salty. And they have some adaptations that make them so that they can survive in those conditions. Those are called archaea. And then this one right here would be bacteria. Now, let me explain um, a situation there with archaea. When you hear archaea, you probably hear ancient, right? So something that is ancient. 
The problem was when they first discovered these extremophiles, they thought that maybe they were really, really old and early prokaryotic cells. So that's why they called them archaea. But as it turns out, they are not, okay? That, um, that bacteria came first and archaea evolved from that. In fact, archaea has very, very uh, similar properties to some eukaryotes as well. And we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later. But for right now, you need to know the two domains. Remember, all life into three domains. The two domains that contain prokaryotic cells are bacteria and archaea. So on the outside, um, you want to add that they have a plasma membrane. So that's the very first layer, right, of the cell. That's what makes the cell is the plasma membrane. Then next out, the next layer is the cell wall. And it's made of what's called a peptidoglycan. Let me say that again, peptidoglycan. And what do you hear in there? Peptide. And there's some proteins. Glycan sounds like a carbohydrate made of a peptidoglycan. And that helps maintain the cell shape helps maintain cell shape. And then number three is this outer capsule that you see right here, and this is called a glycocalyx. It's carbohydrates, glyco, think like glycogen, right? That should sound familiar. Um, it's not made out of glycogen, but I want you to think about carbohydrates. Glycocalyx is a layer of polysaccharides. We learned about that important organic molecule, and it can either be a capsule if it's organized or a slime layer if not. Okay, and then you can have several appendages that are coming off. Um, you could have this appendage right here that's a flagella, and this is like a whip-like tail to help it move. You have fimbriae, that's what I was pointing out here. These help grip it onto a surface, so flagella was for movement. Fimbriae are small bristle-like structures that help bacteria attach to surfaces. And then a sex pili, so you're they have a couple, it doesn't look any different in this picture from the fimbriae, but it does look different. I'll show you another picture. So the sex pili are tubes used to pass DNA, tubes used to pass DNA from cell to cell. Sorry, my watch thinks I'm talking to it. Um, tubes used to pass DNA from cell to cell. All right, so let's move in. So I'm going to show you um, a picture here. We can look, see all the different shapes that are here. Okay, and so let's take a look at um, the cell membrane that I told you about is that first interior layer. So look to see, okay, and we learned about the four important organic molecules. So which of the four, I'm asking you, which of the four important organic molecules do you see in this diagram? Okay, hopefully you saw these protein molecules, and some of these protein molecules go all the way across the cell membrane, and some just go partially across, and we're gonna learn about those again in chapter five, and proteins are made out of amino acids. And then the second one you should have noticed are phospholipids. Remember, that is a modification of a fat. Remember, fat is made out of glycerol and three long fatty acid chains. One of those fatty acid chains has been removed. Remember, the fatty acid chains are hydro, Phobic, right? And it has been replaced with a polar hydrophilic head of phosphates and oxygen. And so notice the arrangement of this cell membrane. All the fatty acids that are hydrophobic are here in the center of the membrane. And then these polar heads that are hydrophilic are either facing the um, watery interior of the cell, the cytosol, or it's facing the fluid that the cell is sitting in. All right? And then um, here, let's take a look at this picture. I know those words are small. I've got another slide for you where I hit the main things on that. But let's again, let's get our bearings here. So we can see the interior. We can see the nucleoid region right here. This is the DNA. You can see these little dots. These are ribosomes. Look right here. Here's that sex pillus I told you about. This is not a permanent structure. Um, this is something that's grown out and used when needed. You can see the fimbriae, those hair-like structures. You can see how they look different from the sex pillars are all over here on the outside. You can see the flagella. So we talked about those. Now working out from um, the cell membrane, if you work your way out a little bit farther, you can see this cell wall. If you remember, I said that was made out of peptidioglycan, right? And then you have this, okay, 
stop talking to me, watch. And then you can see here, you can see um, the glycocalyx. This is the carbohydrate, la carbohydrate layer on the outside. And later we'll talk about gram positive, gram negative, and what that means too. So there's some modifications. All right, do you remember I told you, you could have like microvilli, I gave you an example where you fold out to increase surface area, and then you could have those where it has a fold in in order to create um, increased surface area. So that's an example right here. I also mentioned to you that prokaryotic cells are found in two domains. Bacteria is one domain. And then the second bacteria, the second one is archaea. Remember, these are your extremophiles. I know this isn't a great picture for you, but remember, there's no membrane enclosed organelles to look for in archaea. All right, so let's go. I've got another slide here for you where I kind of have all these structures um, identified. Okay, so you can see I talked about the sex pillars, surface attachment, and movement. There are things called little inclusion bodies that store substances. The mesosomes increase surface area. Ribosomes, their function is for protein synthesis, and that's in all cells, okay? The nucleoid is where the DNA is. The plasma membrane, that's where you exchange, everything goes in and out. Cell wall made out of peptidioglycan. And the glycocalyx, the outermost layer, are uh, that's a polysaccharide. So on your notes, let's just kind of finish those in on your notes. So the cytosol contains water, um, inorganic and organic molecules, and enzymes. So that's something I didn't mention, but that is the fluid portion inside. It's called the cytosol. Okay, so it contains water, inorganic and organic molecules and enzymes. Um, you have the nucleoid region and the nucleoid region right here. Okay, and it's also here. This is the region that contains the single circular chromosome. So let's talk about that just for a quick minute. Okay, in eukaryotic cells, okay, in eukaryotic cells, we talk about chromosomes. You have a total of 46 chromosomes, 23 homologous pairs, exception if you're male and you have the XY, those are not homologous, okay? But you have a total of 46 chromosomes. Um, a potato has 48 chromosomes, so, you know, numbers. Um, but in prokaryotic cells, they do not have linear chromosomes. They have a single circular chromosome. Now, they can have additional pieces of DNA information, and those are called plasmids. And genetic engineers like to use plasmids and manipulate those um, in order to get a cell to make a certain product that you might want to need, that you might want to need, that you might need or want to harvest. And if we get to return to school this year, um, and if you are in my classroom, then we will do a genetic engineering lab where we will manipulate a plasmid and we will make it so we'll put it in a prokaryotic cell bacteria and get that ba bacteria to generate um, red fluorescent proteins. And we're going to get that DNA from a jellyfish. So just a little side note. All right, so um, let's go back over here, okay? So it has a single circular chromosome. Um, next, um, plasmids are small accessory rings of DNA, and here I'll show you a plasmid Move myself, okay? So, and this is not drawn to scale, okay? So here's the single circular chromosome, and then here's an additional piece of DNA called a plasmid. It would never look this simple like a ring. It's very large and so when you see it in the cell it's like all kind of in a ball like what you would see uh, if you pulled something out of your hairbrush. You know it just be with all crinkled inside of that um, cell. All right um, next we have um, Sorry about that, I got distracted. Plasmid, small accessory rings of DNA. And then you have ribosomes, which are the workbench for protein synthesis. Workbench for protein synthesis. Now, archaea, which is newer and um, newer and younger, okay? Some differences about archaea. Um, their cell wall still uh, is now a polysaccharide, okay? And remember when we talked about cell walls here for bacteria, it was made out of a peptidioglycan, but for archaea, it's a polysaccharide. Their cell membranes are a little bit different than bacteria. They are made with fatty acids, 
um, not with fatty acids, but with hydrocarbons. So not a fatty acid, but hydrocarbons, slight difference. Okay, their DNA and RNA structure is more similar to eukaryotes like us, more similar to eukaryotes like us, and many are found in extreme conditions. All right, so let's keep going. We saw that. Okay, so if I was gonna pick um, a poster child for bacteria to represent bacteria, I would pick cyanobacteria. And I just wanna kind of plant that in your head. And, and the reason why I wanna pick cyanobacteria is number one, they are responsible for a lot of ox oxygen in our environment through the process of photosynthesis. And also they assist, they do a lot of nitrogen fixation, which takes nitrogen in a form N2 and gets it into a form to start the process so that plants can use that nitrogen. Um, here um, shows you what I was talking about, about the different domains. So when we look at the domains that we have, right, we have archaea and bacteria, right? We talked about that. They are both made out of prokaryotic cells. Um, and then you have eukarya like us. And eukaryotes, they are divided, and you can make more kingdoms than this. This is the simplest way to show it. You can divide them into these four kingdoms. So fungi, right? These are still heterotrophs um, that absorb their nutrients. Animalia are ingestive heterotrophs. Plantae, photosynthesis, and then protista. Protista are eukaryotic cells. They can be in large, you know, they can be in large clusters and large organizations. We'll look at that, but you usually see them as unicellular. And the protista can be um, heterotrophs or autotrophs as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, okay? And we're gonna compare prokaryotes and eukaryotes here. Again, these are not drawn to scale. This prokaryotic cell right here is about the size of this structure right in here, this mighty mitochondria, okay? But you can see the differences, right? They don't have these membrane enclosed organelles like the eukaryotic cells do. All right, and then I'm gonna use this slide as a transition slide to go into the eukaryotic cells in our second video. All right, so hope you're having a great day.